and I wear this shirt, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I got my new fresh haircut. I'm ready to go. Control that thing. Back All right. Up. You can go ahead and start talking. It'll take a while for that. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So, so uh, we're kind of going through the whole 1A tools uh, today. And uh, a big thing for me is uh, the difference between the aluminum wheels and the brass wheels. And I have to say, you know, coming from the world of, of uh, geared heads, uh, where the the mechanics of them are very exact and the wheels are very heavy, uh, you know, 1A Tools has really addressed this, and they've come out with the brass wheels that are very heavy. They're like three times what the aluminum is, and it's all about the finesse. When you're in the the uh, you know, in the the meat of it, and you have to do make very subtle changes. I'm talking about just a slight change. The actor takes a couple, just a little step forward or slides over to the right. These adjustments are so subtle, and having the 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 more weight really helps with that subtlety because when it's very light, it's very easy to to uh, move quickly, and that's what you don't really want. Now there's tons of gizmos and, and stuff that you can turn down the speed and the sensitivity and all this stuff. But when it's all said and done, it, it's really the wheels that are, are making you uh, be able to react and, and make it as smooth as possible. Yeah, and, and just from an engineering standpoint, the, the physics of the real weight of the wheels actually translates into the physics of the shot. So we try to, with the heavy wheels, you can turn everything down to zero. No smoothing, nothing, but the physical weight of the wheels is what's giving the actual shot you're smoothing. And it allows the motors to work as hard as they can, but ultimately the real heavy inertia of the wheels is giving you your smooth shot. Nice. All right, and we have this all set up with the Movi controller, but there's also an option to go for all you uh, Ronin users. So this uh, kind of eliminates the Movi controller and then kind of affixes itself on yeah. here, right? Yeah, so the, the Alpha Link is kind of our solution to help anybody starting out that may not want to invest in the, the Movi controller, they can start out with just the Alpha Link, which is a small module that sits right on top of the Alpha wheels. And uh, you mount a tiny receiver to your gimbal, whether it's a Movi Pro, XL, or Ronin 2, or even the original Ronins. And uh, you can easily control it. You have speed controls right there built in and a nice wireless range and get started for pretty affordable. And what I'm constantly dealing with on set is you got Preston controllers, you got Teradex wireless feeds, you got all this RF uh, interference that's going on all the time. So you need something that cuts through this. And what they've done is they've built a, a nice little uh, antenna pod that you can elevate to seven or eight feet uh, above your monitor and everything. And then this just screws down in and then you're able to uh, put this kind of, this is more of a high intensity antenna yeah, as well, this right? Is our, yeah, this combo right here is our high gain antenna kit and it right. works on both the Mobi controller and the Alpha Link. So uh, you can, in fact, in lots of other devices because it has a standard RPSMA connector. On. Well, I wish I had had this on Rim of the World <laughs> uh, because we were losing signal all the time and the thing was like 15 feet away, you know? It's like, people, get out of the way, you know? it's like. It's crazy, yeah. But that—that's really nice. And then again, it's always getting like backup cables with this thing. Uh, even just these small little jumpers uh, right here can always go bad on you. You know, it's like people are constantly pulling them out, putting them in, pulling them out, pulling them in. So you always want to get backup cables for all this stuff set up, so you're out, not out in the middle of nowhere, and then the cable goes bad, and you're like, oh my god! All right, we got any questions there? All right, yeah, let's, uh, okay, what do you think about the new Blackmagic Cinema Camera 4K? It's not that relevant, but. The Blackmagic Cinema 4K, is that the pocket one are we talking about? The new one that just got released? Yeah. Yeah, the, the image, here's the thing about that camera that I, 
first takeaway of the images that I saw of it, finally, the black magic has got the skin tones down. So the skin tones are really starting to look great without a ton of post manipulation. That's what we saw with the first iterations of the black magic. And now this new sensor seems to really grab the skin tone. Awesome. And they're saying, uh, they're asking, where is that shirt from? Oh my God. <laughs> this is from my, uh, my very good friend. Jared Poland. Yeah, Jared Poland. Uh, I did a uh, a podcast with him last, I think, spring in Philadelphia, and it was such a hoot. And he hooked me up with this shirt, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So everyone right now is saying hi. We're going to open up this to uh, Q and A. So if you guys have any questions, go ahead and ask. Uh, are there any more like uh, details we can cover about the wheels or? Sure, I mean, the, happy to talk about how easy they integrate the Mobi controller. If you if you can actually show the screen, uh, if you have a Mobi controller, you may not know this, but in your TX menu under the TX mode, it normally says normal there. You can just easily switch it over into Alpha wheels, and uh, it automatically starts communicating with the wheels. It sets itself up right away, and uh, it's it's pretty easy to use actually. Yeah, that's the cool thing. I think Free Fly and you all have worked together yeah. very nicely. And, yeah. you know, when I was first starting out with just wheel technology uh, t all together with the uh, Movi M10 on Fathers and Daughters, uh, we had uh, taken the Hot Gear setup and actually made an analog to digital yeah. conversion yeah. and everything. And, and I, I remember you know, being on the, the comm system and I had to be able to tilt before the person got up. Yeah. I had to stop before the person stopped. Everything was such a delay. And uh, there was a lot of swearing on the comms, uh, to, to say the least on this. But now uh, this last iteration that you've done, yeah. uh, working uh, f finally in conjunction with yeah. the manufacturer yeah. and everything and really understanding all of it, uh, these wheels were incredible on Rim of the World. I mean, very accurate. I, I felt like I was jumping on a gearhead for the first time, and that's what's really so exciting. Me and my business partner are both union cinematographers, and for the people at Freefly and DJI, when we first approached them, we're the first ones to explain them how wheels even work and what the purpose <laughs> of them was. Right. So explaining to them, you know, yes, absolute position is really important. They need it to be, you know, when you say the headroom is here and you move back and then you return, it should be in the same spot. And that was a kind of it was a learning process for everyone to work on the gimbal side and on the wheel side. Um, but we're incredibly proud of the partnership yeah. we have with them and no, free fly. Great. I mean, they're they're incredibly responsive and incredibly interested in making sure that the pro market has the wheels they need to, especially with their Mobi XL, which really needs, no, it needs, needs that power to yeah. you know, take full advantage of what it's capable of. Yeah. What else we got? Awesome. People are just still saying hi. Um, Hello. Someone's, uh, someone's talking about the, the skin tone comment you made about the black magic. They say it's because of the 4.0 color science. Ah. Yeah. Well, I didn't dig deep into it. I just <laughs> saw the imagery and was very happy. Awesome. All right, guys, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask. Shane's here for a limited time, so this is like your one and only moment to get a live Q&A with Shane. Yeah, so what <laughs> I'm doing is uh, after this week, uh, after Labor Day, I'm heading up to Vancouver, and I'm starting my next uh, project, which is going to be a pilot for Dark Horse Comics and Amblin and Universal. Uh, and that's a very exciting project. And uh, I can't wait to uh, to get up there and start. The director, David Dopkin, has an incredible vision uh, for the project. And uh, we did Into the Badlands together. So it's going to be a great reunion. Awesome. Is the Pocket Cam uh, 4K, is that going to be your new stunt cam from Blackmagic, that Pocket Cinema? I think that would be my new crash cam drive over, just completely try to destroy camera. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. uh, so far, I hit the Ursa Mini Pro so hard on Rim of the World. We hit it 50 miles an hour in a crash camera, and it snapped the whole 
handle off inside the crash housing and, and sheared the screen off. How is this possible? I have no idea, but uh, we got it uh, all fixed. I, I have a question for yeah. you. With, uh, how, did Evo, how did wheels for you What are you working with it after? Well, there was no, there was, <laughs> there wasn't any time when I wasn't working with wheels. Okay. Because when the Moby uh, M10 came out in the fall of 2012, I was the first cinematographer to deploy it on a feature film in, in this winter of 2013. Okay. So I literally was. You're in there. The I was <laughs> wheeling it to the beginning, right? Yeah. This is 2013 calling up people, saying, how can we communicate it, getting on the phone with Tab at FreeFly, yeah. getting the Hot Gears guy together, and those guys just talking amongst themselves, trying to figure out a fix. Yeah. And it was a Band-Aid for sure, but uh, I knew that there was no way to work it unless I had this. Yeah. Because from a cinema standpoint, I don't work on joysticks, I don't work in Mimic, I don't work in any of these no. things. I work with the precision of, of uh, something that's very cinematic and very precise. Yeah. yeah. So for somebody that already owns a gimbal, whether it's Ronin or Moby, what do you think the investment wheels would add to how they use the gimbal? Well, I think the power of the Moby is not you just putting it in your hands and just running around with it. Yeah. It's, it's two people. Yeah. And the last three movies that I've done with Chris Hare and then the anti-gravity arm and you know there's no need for dollies anymore. I, I didn't use a dolly at all. Yeah. Chris was able to do push-ins. You saw no steps, but then I was there or my op a camera operator operating the shot. He was the vehicle. Yeah. He was he was just concentrating on his footsteps, uh, making it as smooth as possible. And, and hitting a mark, yep. and Mosley was all about the composition. Yep. And that's when you take your vision here and take it all the way yeah. up to here. It's kind of like this perfect balance of freedom of movement and precision. Yes. Because you have like the freedom. No, you have the freedom. You're just any, I mean, that's what I've never seen this before. Yeah. And I, we've never felt so free yeah. to move as actors. And you just move with us, yeah. Uh, and that was something that really, you know, continued to open my eyes because I consistently use the movie not as a gag shot, as a as a trick shot, but as changing the way I make yeah. movies. Yeah, you know, literally no dance floors, no yeah. dollies. Yeah. We ebb and flow and move with the actors seamlessly. That's the the reinvention. Yeah, I, uh, I I worked with a director who used to work at Pixar, and he was saying that when I show up with the wheels and Moby, it actually feels very close to virtual cinematography. Right, exactly. Because you can just in a computer, you just move the camera wherever it needs to be. Yeah. And now the way that I like to work with the wheels and the Moby is, you, if you want to adjust the camera, adjust it. Just move it over there to you know change your eye line a little, do a little push in. Yeah, you can kind of like feel how you're moving now that you have the precision of the wheel. Oh, and you yeah. come into a shot, and I'll be on comms, and I'm like, just drop a little, just drop yeah. it a little. Yeah, okay. now and we're, you're making it up as you go. Yeah, and then yeah. Like, okay, now we're gonna wrap. Now we're gonna wrap. You know, and it's like you just start to see it all come up, come alive, and it starts to fit what the actor is saying. And now, how can we make this guy more of a hero? All right, we'll drop right at this moment. You know, and then. It's just great. Yeah. No. Sure. I have a lighting question for you. Yeah. <clears throat> if you can't afford a, a sky panel, what's a good cheaper alternative? <clears throat> okay. So from a sky panel uh, standpoint, I'd say the Cineo is a step down from the sky panel. So you got the Cineo. I think it's the standard 400 in that. What's that is, Josh? Standard 410. The 410. RGB. Yeah, the RGB. So that has the punch of a sky panel, uh, and it's got a lot of RGB functions, and it's like a, a two thirds of what a sky panel costs, right? And then you even go down a little further, and then there's the uh, I'd say the the DMG luminaires, but they don't have they have a new mix coming out, which is uh, the Roscoe has, and those LEDs are starting to. They're going to release those, I think, in November, and that light is incredible. 
lot of high output, uh, excellent uh, CRI, and it's going to be priced somewhere like 50% of what a sky panel is. And then you can go down to more of a light mat kind of scenario with like a DP Lumi, uh, which has uh, is like a one by three, and it's either daylight or it's by color. Uh, the CRI is very good, but you don't get RGB and all that stuff. You get a, a very high output ballast, and you get really good color uh, for something that weighs like three pounds, where the sky panel weighs 60. Uh, but you don't get, obviously, all the computer controls of it. You just get the output of a sky panel out of that one by three. Awesome. And when shooting with the Red Dragon 6K, do you have a rule for over and under exposure? Uh, when do you let things clip, if ever? I let things clip when it looks like it's cool to clip. I, I do everything off of my LUTs, so I'm never looking at the raw file. Uh, so if it's clipping on my LUTs, then I'm saying, okay, those windows, I want them to blow. There's not much out there that I really want to see. Uh, or if it's... Uh, you know, hot sun coming into a car, and I want that, uh, I want the feeling of the, uh, maybe the white shirt or whatever to kind of blow in, in the car, then I'll let that clip. Uh, but a lot of times I'm, I'm trying to keep things balanced because I know I can push the whites later on, but there's sometimes when you just can't balance it all the way and you just got to kind of go with it. Uh, I would say that based on, the ability of the Gemini now, uh, the Gemini sensor seems to have a better roll off in the clip. Uh, so it's it's not falling off kind of like the uh, Dragon did, much more, you know, it, it rounds the, the uh, edges a lot better. And uh, I, I really like how this last movie I shot all Gemini, and uh, I think it's the best sensor Red has ever made. Awesome. Wonder Dog's got to go out. <laughs> okay, you ready, Wonder Dog? Okay. Go out. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, uh, what is a better cheap alternative to the Flanders Scientific Monitors, excluding slash ignoring small HD? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, hmm. I, you know, I, I've never really gone down the road of, I mean, I would say almost an alternative from uh, trying to save money, I would go with like the Flanders, not the OLED, but, uh, you know, the one that's more like that 17 inches, uh, what do they call it? It's not an OLED, but it's, uh, it's just a standard LCD. Yeah, it's an LCD, yeah. yeah. So, because you still get all the power and the false color and everything, which is a very good thing. You get something that's real time, so it doesn't have a delay. And it's like, I mean, $1,700 uh, for the 17 inch. Uh, they dropped a lot. Like the, the, the DM240 is now down to 3,500 bucks or something like that now. So, you know, you got the 17 inch alternative which is somewhere in the middle. Um, and, you know, I, I think as long as you're setting your levels uh, on the side with the Flanders, you're going to know when your blacks are starting to crush and everything, and you don't necessarily need that, you know, absolute crisp black that you get with the OLED monitor. So it can be something where you're working up to. Awesome. And what do you think for a low-budget filmmaker, what's the, what's the best camera you can get for $7,000? Low budget filmmaker, best camera for seven thousand dollars. So specific. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hmm. I mean, there's the Sony, uh, you know, FS seven, which is good. Uh, there's also the, um, the Canon C300 Mark II, uh, the, I think they came out with the C200 Mark II as well. Mark one. Mark one. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, the 200, not the one, the 200. And I mean, those cameras, 
that you just come out of the box, you turn the thing on, the thing looks cinematic. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're a great documentary camera and very lightweight, very compact, good quality. Awesome. And what do you think is the biggest mistake DPs make today? Not being able to communicate their vision. Awesome. All right. Cool. And then uh, one more, uh, Red versus Alexa. What do you think? Okay. <laughs> uh, this, this is a good one. Uh, I Don't get me wrong. I, I, I shot Alexa. I have shot Red. I have shot Sony. I have shot all of them. Uh, what what makes me feel like I'm still in the lab mixing chemicals? The red. Okay. The the Alexa has it's like Procter and Gamble. It comes out of the box, you whip the thing on, you know the fan's gonna turn, it's not gonna have a problem, it's not gonna overheat, it's not gonna, it just does everything just great. The red is quirky. I, that's what, what grabbed me on the digital front was the DSLRs. They were quirky. You, they needed love and holding and hand. And I felt like if I did this one way, it was more like I was pushing or pulling a film stock. If I did this, it felt like I just dragged it down a driveway. If I, if, if I did this other specific thing, it felt like I processed my own film in my bathtub. That's what the red, because you got, and you really need to be a really good, like, director of photography in the art of, you know, art and science. Because with the red, there's so many things, so many sub menus, so many color spaces, so many things that you can do with the camera that really affects the whole end game, even though they quote unquote call it raw, but it's it's something that kind of bakes in and it feels much more like a photochemical process uh, ever since the Dragon sensor came on board. Awesome. And then um, how do you, um, what's your advice for getting into aerial cinematography? Someone wants to just specifically target Aerials. Like drone aerials? Uh, helicopter. Helicopter. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, I, I've used a lot of great aerial cinematographers uh, in the day. Um, you know, I guess, oh God, I, I, I think it would be trying to track some of the um, operators. The SOC probably has a good selection of aerial operators. I don't know if they're offering uh, mentorship and that kind of stuff. Uh, that's what we do a lot here at Orbit Visuals. People that want to be cinematographers, uh, want to be you know technicians. We um, we have a program that we run uh, each year uh, for specifically for female cinematographers, as well as uh, you know the the uh, just cinematographer in general. And, um, you know, we, it's, you got to really find somebody to mentor because you need so much time in the chopper and understanding what lenses work effectively and what kind of your tool uh, is, is your, like when I go up in a helicopter, I'm looking at a 24 to one to a 290. The Ajahn Zoom is one of my favorite helicopter lenses because it gives me everything. Uh, I shot uh, Need for Speed with a 30 to 300, and I was able to get beautiful wide vistas, you know, screaming down the coast of, of uh, California, and then I was able to just crush in on a 300, tracking with the high-speed cars. So, you know, I think it's, it's kind of, there's, I, I don't know how many books there are on aerial cinematography, because that is a very subspecialty. And uh, I think, uh, you know, contacting the SOC, see if there's some kind of programs for aerial cinematography and, uh, and start there. Awesome. And then what would you say is the trickiest part about setting up lights or just lighting in general? I think the trickiest part is, is uh, I, I kind of, 
The way I light is I plan it very much in a vacuum. So I go to the locations, I look at the light, I, I see what the natural light is doing in the room, I see what it looks like. If, if this is gonna be a night exterior, a night interior, I go back there at night to see what's playing around, if there's lights in the distance that we gotta get rid of, or, or some use of practical lights that's in the room that I can take advantage of. Uh, obviously, uh, working with the props department and our department, they're getting me a lot of different practicals and stuff to play with. But I think it's creating that in uh, what I do is a visual description of what that scene, what the light is going to feel like in the room and a description of the color tones and how dark it is and, and all these things. If it's, is it shafty? Is it uh, soft? Is it north light? Is it, you know, I, I do all these visual descriptions. So in my mind, that's what I'm trying to achieve. And when I walk into that room, the team has already got that um, kind of visual sense that they've read. I try to be as descriptive as possible so it kind of flies into your mind and you kind of see it. And that's where I start. And uh, then based on that, I just start, you know, bringing in the, the fixtures and everything that's required. But a lot of times, and this is something that I've been doing most recently, is I'll light a scene and then usually you have no more time. They, they've told you you have to go. And uh, you can't change anything. You just got to go. We're, we're behind, right? So what I find is I'm not being able to turn lights off that I've uh, turned on and maybe I, you know, overlit an area or something. Uh, so I'm trying to be more diligent with myself and, and uh, light it the way I, I want it. But now what I'm going to do on this next movie because I like to change everything up. I, I don't like to do anything the same way. So I'm gonna walk in, I'm gonna turn practical lights on, I'm gonna fire up my camera, and I'm gonna just see what the light looks like before I start adding anything. And then, it's kind of how I used to work with the Canon C500, and the reason I did that is because the damn thing would see light that we didn't even see, you know? So you could not light it like a film camera. Where the red, you can light like a film camera. The Alexa, you can light like a film camera. So that was in my mind that, you know, I, I knew how to do that. But when you turn the, if you lit it like you lit a film camera with the C500, the C300, it looked like shit. Yeah. So it's like you had to plot that camera down. You had to turn it on and you had to dial your color temperature and your ISO and then just look at it. And then see if somebody sat in the chair, if the practical actually illuminated them enough. And what did you need to add? You know, I always try to like the background first before I like the midground or before I like the foreground. So, you know, what, what do I need to add in the background that's gonna work with these practicals in the room? And then it starts, so I'm gonna try, a, you know, I'm gonna go back to my ways of C500 days with this new Gemini because it, it is seeing stuff that I'm not seeing. Uh, and uh, at 3200 ISO, it's, it's it really blows my mind how clean that is. Awesome. Last question. Uh, do you have any uh, workshops coming up? I do not have any workshops coming up, but we do have a workshop that is uh, virtual that we just launched called Mastering Cinematography, Mastering the Image. Uh, it's basically a collection of my October uh, workshop that I did uh, a year or so ago. And we've put it all together, and it has a ton of great learning, and that's on, on the website. So that would be a virtual workshop right now. We're going to see how, after this pilot, um, I'm going to shoot some more content uh, for the Inner Circle, and then uh, we're going to see if we're going to start any workshops up in 2019. And then what is the Inner Circle? Uh, Shane's Inner Circle is a resource for directors, cinematographers, filmmakers, uh, that is a collection of uh, members all over the world. We're in like, uh, I don't know, 130 different countries. And uh, it uh, gives you for a small membership 
how to make Starbucks coffees. Uh, you uh, get this membership where you're able to uh, really get an inside, uh, I kind of pull the curtain back and give you the keys to my castle of what I've learned over the last 30 years of being a cinematographer. We're also going to give you guys a discount code for Inner Circle users. Oh, that's videos. the other thing. Yeah. So, yeah, we've worked out a deal with uh, with everyone over at 1A Tools, and uh, they're giving everyone in the Inner Circle a 15% discount on all of their products. So um, it's pretty exciting, and, and we've started to reach out to a lot of our sponsors, and uh, they're kind of starting to... I'm, sure, I'm working on Tiffin. We just got Music Bed to give us 30% discount on some of their songs. So we're all working to continue to give discounts and, and for our sponsors to really be very engaged. Uh, the other cool thing is once you become a sponsor with us, uh, we give you full access to the Facebook page and you can really start to understand the comments of what uh, the members are using, and, and if they have a problem, you can immediately address it. I wish I had that sort of resource when I was starting. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that easy. Well, uh, Jared has uh, access to it as well at Red, and he's constantly on there, uh, you know, uh, working with the Inner Circle members to kind of help them with all, all their Red, uh, you know, cameras and stuff. It's, it's great. It's an amazing resource. Okay. Awesome. All, all right. right. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye.